Good afternoon, everybody. This is Michael Munson with FORGE. Today's webinar is Serving Transgender Survivors, a 101 for Advocates. I'm really glad that you've all joined us today, and I also want to welcome those of you who are going to be listening to this in the weeks and months after this initial recording in February 2016. Some of our webinars delve really deeply into specific cross-sections of transgender issues and different types of advocacy or service delivery or barriers or other victim service related concepts. But today's webinar, on the other hand, is going to be a little bit more general, an overview of, of some generalized concepts about transgender issues and about advocacy um, in working with transgender survivors. So we have 45 minutes, I'm sorry, 75 minutes of, of time that we'll be spending um, with direct content, and then we'll have around 15 or 20 minutes at the end for questions. The content today is geared towards sexual assault and domestic violence advocates, but hopefully it will be um, appropriate and useful for people who are in other victim service fields. So I know some of you have been on other FORGE webinars in the past or at in-person trainings, and you've likely seen this slide before, or some version of this slide. So I just wanted to go over this as some general housekeeping that we really you know, care about that you take care of yourself. And we know that a lot of times many of us work in this field every day, and it can be really tiring and draining and um, emotionally upsetting sometimes. So we encourage you to take care of yourself, and please know that we are recording the webinar so that you can you know, listen to it later if you'd like to, if you want to take a break. Know, too, that we will be sending out the PowerPoints tomorrow, so you'll have an access to the, the PowerPoints as well as the recording, which will be up tomorrow, and then a closed caption version of that will be up within the next week. We'll have a little bit of interaction today, so feel free to participate at your comfort level. I just wanted to make sure that folks know where to ask questions and know where to interact with us. So the main place that you'll be interacting with us is through the, the question box. It should look something like what's on the screen, if you're able to see the screen. And just to make sure that we can um, all figure out where it is, how about if um, folks can find that box and type in what name you go by and what pronoun you use. So just type in your name and pronoun in that question box. Excellent. So I'm seeing a lot of lot of names and lots of different pronouns. So excellent. It looks like most of you have found the box. So that is the place, um, and you, you, you can all keep on going with your name and pronouns. That's perfect. Um, that is the place where, um, if you have questions as we go go along, please feel free to an ask them there. Laurie Cook Daniels, who is the uh, other Forge staff person on this call and who will be doing part of the content, will be monitoring that area mostly for questions that we'll answer at the end of the webinar and some that will be answered in the middle. So if you have logistical questions, she'll be happy to answer those as, as we go along. So thanks for everybody for participating in the, the name and pronoun. We are not going to do a poll today, but if we were, you'd see a screen very much like this. So let me just share with you a little bit about uh, the agenda and the territory that we're going to be covering today. Like I mentioned before, we're not going to be going as deeply as some of you might like, but hopefully you'll leave with knowing where you can access more information about the subjects that are most important to you related to transgender survivors. We have archived resources on our website that I'll point out as we go along where you can explore some of the topics that we cover in a lot more detail. So our agenda for today is we'll be covering some Transgender 101 concepts, probably in a way that many of you haven't heard before. It'll be slightly different than, than some traditional trainings. We all come from different backgrounds, so we want to have some, some basic information that we, we share as we move forward. We'll then um, talk about some data about violence against trans people. Laurie is going to talk about this section and, and share some very brief data just to give us a general picture of, of violence that trans people are experiencing, particularly related to sexual assault and domestic violence. She'll then move us into a section on trans-specific barriers, which will be research-based and will give folks an idea of what kinds of specific challenges trans survivors are facing when trying to access sexual assault and domestic violence services. 
We'll move then into a section about what you can do. So we, it's, it's a fairly detailed section, but it, it will be linked to what advocates can do and some reminders of the content that we've already shared. And then we'll have, like I said, about 15 or 20 minutes at the end for questions um, of any sort that, that come up for you. So let me start off with sharing a little bit about who Forge is, because I know not, not everybody is familiar with the work that we do, and I'd like to give you just a little bit of a thumbnail. We are a trans organization that is 100% funded to focus on anti-violence work. Um, so again, those two intersections of, of transgender survivors and professionals who serve them. We were founded in 1994, so this marks our 21st or 22nd anniversary, depending on where you count it. And um, we're headquartered in Milwaukee, but our work is national. So all of the work that we do is, is national. We predominantly work with victim service providers. So around 75 or 80% of our time and effort is spent working with service providers. And then around 25% of our time is spent directly working with transgender and gender nonconforming survivors and loved ones. We have two foundational principles that guide all of the work that we do. So when we engage with both survivors and providers, our first goal is to approach this through a trauma-informed lens. And that means that we need to always keep um, up to date on what's going on because trauma-informed theory is changing all the time, as many of you know. And the second foundational principle, again, in both how we work with survivors and providers, is to focus on empowerment. So through highlighting things like resilience and building on existing knowledge and promoting a sense of confidence. Um, we don't want to do our work with providers in a way that feels condescending or, or is, is in a hierarchical way. We just want to meet, be able to help you all do your work better and to better serve trans survivors. So just a really quick glance of, of who our staff is. We have three full-time staff. We have a, a very small staff, but a large vision, and we try to do as much work as we can. Um, again, I'm Michael Munson, um, Forge's co-founder, executive director. Um, I'm one of the primary trainers and um, provide a lot of oversight to the projects and publications that we do. Lori Cook Daniels, who is also on the call today and, and doing part of the, the middle section and monitoring the questions, is our policy and program director. She is uh, predominantly our main writer and um, our person that gets us most of our funding. And then Katie, we've got a little bit of background, sorry about that. Um, Katie Taylor is our project coordinator and, and is involved with several initiatives. Quite the bubbly voice you'll hear on many of our, our webinars and, and any of our training. And let me see if we could just, just try to mute and get all of the sound. Sorry about the, the sound involvement there. So moving into a little bit of what we can offer you. So you know, beyond this webinar, I wanted to make sure that you all left with a little bit of what we as Forge can offer you. We are predominantly a tech training and technical assistance provider, so that means that we provide one-on-one -on -one support. So email us with a question or call us with a question, and we're more than happy to um, try to find solutions with you, whether it's a short question or a really long question. We do webinars like this one. We do webinars um, specifically for organizations. A few weeks ago, we did one for the Washington Coalition, for example. Um, so we, we'd be more than happy to create webinars specifically for an organization. We do trainings at conferences, and we have many, many publications that are available for free and easily findable on our website. I always want to make sure, too, that providers know about the support that we offer for transgender survivors. We have a listserv, which is, is incredibly not very active, but it's there for people who want to reach out to other survivors and other trans folks um, at any point in time. We have a fairly large referral database, so um, that can be used by both providers and survivors to hopefully get folks connected to people that are trans-informed and trauma-informed. You'll be seeing some of the SPAVO project photos as we go through. Um, it's a photographic and narrative project. And then we also have publications that are specifically geared towards survivors. 
we are predominantly funded through the Office of Violence Against Women, and the, this webinar and all of our webinars are funded through them, and we are incredibly grateful for their financial support and our ability to bring trainings to you. So you'll see many photos as we go through today. So this is one of the Espava photos that I mentioned, and we really believe that it's, it's critically important to put actual faces with stories and with data that we're talking about. So although the images will not necessarily be linked directly to a specific story, we want you to have an idea of who transgender people are. We oftentimes are, are asked questions or people kind of infer that they don't know who transgender people are, and sometimes pictures really speak louder than, than words. So you'll see many photos, and I, I hope that you'll see the incredible resilience and beauty and just amazingness of the people that you see. We, of course, have permission to use all the photos, and um, some of them have more than one person in them, so I want to just point out that not every person in every picture is trans, and not every person in every picture is necessarily a survivor, but most of them are. So let's get started with some trans basics. So this is a section that we're just going to talk a little bit about um, kind of getting on the same page, the same chapter, the same book, so that we're using some of the same kind of concepts and definitions in a very slippery sort of way and, and just getting a common sense of what we're doing together. So ideally we'd have a poll, but let's use that question box again. So if you were asked what percentage of the population is transgender, would you say that it's 0.5%, 1.7%, or 3%? So if folks want to type in your answer, so I'm seeing a lot of Cs and Bs, so a lot of 1.7s, a lot of 3.0s, a couple of 0.5s. Excellent. All right, so it looks like the majority of folks are answering B or C which is great. So this is kind of a trick question or kind of a, a free-for-all question because we don't really know how many people are transgender in the United States or in the world. We don't have good data. We don't ask people on the census what, what their gender identity is, and even if we did, we may not find out if they were trans or not. So prevalence rates are, are difficult to determine also because people define transgender in very different ways. Um, sometimes more inclusively, sometimes more exclusively. And um, sometimes people, again, will not self-identify as transgender even though they have a transgender history. So it's fairly um, accurate to assume that someplace between 0.3% and 1% of the population is transgender. So the Williams Institute, which is out of UCLA, is a little bit more conservative, and they estimate around that 0.3%. And then other people like Lynn Conway and other researchers think that it's more like 1%. So that would be including more folks that are gender non-binary, people that are maybe not taking transitional steps that we commonly think of when we think of transgender people. We're going to be using that 1% as we go through today. So if we look at the population of the United States, there's roughly 300 million people in the United States. So if we take 1% of that, that means that around 3 million people are transgender in the United States. So as we're talking about transgender 101 issues, um, I'm going to share two different things that may kind of seem a little bit out of place, and I hope you'll see how it does fit into this very quickly as we move through. So one of the, the two concepts is this concept of master status thinking. So um, this was a concept that was put forward in the 1940s by Everett Hughes, and then in 1954 by Gordon Allport in his book, The Nature of Prejudice. And he talked about it in terms of calling it the label of primary potency. Both of these terms refer to the tendency of people to believe that only one label or demographic category um, is it's more important than any other aspect of that person's background, behavior, or performance. How this commonly plays out for transgender people is that sometimes when a provider learns that a client is transgender, they assume that, for example, all medical conditions are related to that person being transgender, that being transgender causes uh, a sexual assault or, or other types of violence, that all relationship strains might be due to being trans, or that a job loss or other hardship is caused by being trans. 
And the reality is that people can have medical conditions that are totally not related to being trans. People can have relationship struggles because they don't have good communication skills. People might lose their job because they don't show up. So there's lots of reasons why things can happen, and it's not always linked to one characteristic. And I know that's a fairly obvious concept, but sometimes we forget about that when we have something new or something that we don't um, have a lot of experience with. So this concept is going to be really important when we uh, talk today. So master status thinking, as you can see, could be applied to um, transness or any number of variables in a person's life. So avoiding this kind of pigeonholing and limiting people to just one part of who they are is going to be really central to how we talk about things today. So to add a little bit more detail to how this plays out, specifically around someone's trans identity experience or history, is that a provider may prioritize their transness over, for example, the client's sexual assault, which they might be seeking services for. Oftentimes this translates to a provider being maybe more curious about the trans person's history and experience. They may express their curiosity through questions, and those questions are oftentimes invasive or inappropriate that focus on the person's transness rather than their sexual assault, which they're seeking care for. Trans people are frequently asked questions that would never usually be asked to someone that somebody knows to be non-transgender. So people may ask trans people about their genitals, about their former name, again, about people, about things that are really personal and not commonly asked of non-trans people. Many times providers will take over conversations and redirect the flow back to a person's trans identity um, versus empowering the client to share and direct the discussion and the care that they're seeking. This can also play out when a provider correctly or incorrectly makes the decision that victimization was caused by or is correlated with a person's transness. So as you can see, this concept of master status can be applied to you know, either transness or other variables like disability or trauma or race or age or just about anything else that somebody grabs onto and believes is the most important thing. So that was the first kind of concept that we wanted to, to talk about. And the second one is the terms paradox. So you'll hear today that FORGE doesn't provide a lot of definitions, uh, you know, a long list of def definitions that we want people to memorize. We don't do this because of what we've called the terms paradox. It teaches us that on the one hand, identity labels and names and pronouns and language that an individual uses are absolutely critical. To be culturally competent, we need to find out what terms a person uses to refer to themselves and then reflect those terms back to them. So this use of the client's terms tells them that we're listening and we respect their right to self-define. The paradox is that the terms that people use are often less meaningful than we think for a couple of reasons. First of all, definitions of terms are really hotly contested, both within the trans community and outside of it. So if you asked 100 trans people, for example, to define the word transgender, you probably would get 100 different answers, probably some of them in direct opposition to each other. Second thing is that what you really need to know about um, transgender people in order to serve them more appropriately isn't necessarily going to come from an identity term. Our time today will help you determine what kinds of questions you may need to ask somebody in order to help them access the information and the care and the services that they need. So the terms paradox can be applied to identity labels, experiences, personal history, body part names, pronouns, nearly any part of a person, um, any component of who a person is. For example, someone might tell you that they are a woman of trans experience, which generally means that she was raised and socialized in a role of uh, a boy, an assigned male at birth, but now lives or in other way expresses some female identity. So this is really useful information, but that fact alone won't help you determine what to know in order to serve her more effectively. It tells you what language to use with her. So she's classified herself, she's identified herself as a woman or a woman of transgender experience, but it doesn't tell you how you might need to tailor, tailor services for her if you need to tailor them at all. So for that, you might need to ask more questions in a sensitive and selective way. 
So for advocates, think about how if somebody comes in and, and says that they are a survivor or uses the word survivor, we definitely would want to use the word survivor as a basic sign of respect, that we're listening and honoring their language and their self-definition. We wouldn't want to, for example, refer to them as a victim if their language is survivor. But it doesn't really tell us what kind of a survivor they are. It doesn't tell us what kind of services they might need. So it's important, again, to honor and respect the language that's used, but then we might need to ask some additional questions. So those were the, that was a really long preface to get to who are we talking about when we're talking about trans people. So when we hear or see the word transgender or any of the hundreds of other words that might be synonymous or closely allied words to transgender, I think we each have an image that comes to our mind. Each of us, if asked, would describe who transgender people are a little bit differently, and that's really, really a good thing. Each of us brings with us a mental image or a theoretical framework or an academic construct about what transgender means and who we're talking about when somebody says the word transgender. And it's really kind of a neat thing that unlike just a couple of years ago, nearly everyone today has some connection to trans people and trans issues. So it might be that you're one of the 20 million people that watched the Diane Sawyer interview of Caitlyn Jenner. It might be that you watch some of the other um, media-related shows like Transparent or Orange is the New Black or I Am Jazz. Others of you might have kids who are involved with school districts sorry, school districts that are involved in adopting trans-inclusive policies, maybe around bathrooms, um, which is a hot issue right now. You might also have a family member or a loved one who's transgender, or you may have worked with clients who are transgender or gender non-binary, or you might have a neighbor or coworker or somebody else that you know who's transgender. I'm hoping that by the end of this webinar today, whatever your current knowledge is or whatever your beliefs are, that you'll have a little bit more of an expanded concept of who trans people are and how to more effectively work with transgender clients. So like I said before, we're not going to define terms, mostly because that's not going to help us understand who trans people are. Defining terms gives us more labels to assign to people rather than truly understanding who that person is. I do want to note, though, that many trans people um, highly value labels that they choose for themselves, and of course we want to honor those labels and respect their right to self-define. I just don't want to be the one, we don't want to be the ones to be defining those terms for them. So who are we talking about? Who is under this big label of, of transgender people? When we use the word trans, we're talking about a, a very broad spectrum of people who may identify as trans or as previously trans, and we're, we're including some of the people like the following um, two slides. There's two slides of, of potential people that fall under this large umbrella. So we're talking about people who are gender nonconforming, so people who may intentionally or not blur stereotypical cultural lines of binary gender, so binary means male-female gender. We're also talking about people who transition from one gender to another. We're talking about people who are questioning their gender or who may not feel like the gender that they were assigned at birth fits who they are. We're also talking about people who don't fit into the binary, so people who may identify with a gender other than male and female. We're also talking about people who are gender conforming but have a trans history. So they may have transitioned from one gender to another but now view themselves as male or female and as no longer as transgender. We're also talking about people who are multiply gendered, so people who may live parts of their lives in different genders or who may identify as more than one gender at the same time. And with FORGE, we're also talking about significant others, friends, family, and allies. And for us, we include significant others, friends, family, and allies because we know that violence and discrimination impacts both transgender people and the people who are close to them. Sometimes pictures do speak louder than words, and, and I mentioned that we'd have a lot of photos as we went through today. And I wanted to show you three slides to help us gain some clarity in 
what sometimes is confusing. So when we talk about transfeminine, transmasculine, or gender non-binary, sometimes those are really confusing things. So the folks that can see the slide right now, the these folks um, would identify under some place under the transfeminine umbrella. So you might hear people like the folks that are on the slide referring to themselves as trans women or women of trans history or male to female transsexuals or formerly transgender, any number of words like that. These are individuals who were assigned male at birth but who now identify or live some or all of their life in a more feminine way, so either as female or expressing more stereotypically feminine characteristics. On the other hand, the folks that are on this slide, um, which is coming up for a little bit slowly, um, would identify under that transmasculine spectrum. So you might hear folks that are pictured on the screen referring to themselves as trans men or studs or formerly transgender, or any number of other words um, that are transmasculine identified. So again, these folks are, are people who are assigned female at birth, but who live or identify some or all of their life um, in a more masculine way. So they live as men or male, and they're expressing more stereotypically masculine characteristics. So the folks on the next slide, um, around gender non-binary or agender, the language associated with the images on this slide have shifted the most in the past several years. And it's, it's critical to keep in mind that not everyone identifies as either male or female, um, or is even heading in one of those two directions. Many people identify as multiple genders or no gender at all. Some intentionally challenge binary gender norms, um, and some, you know, there, there, there are many ways that people can live and, and do things that do not conform to that societally constructed and reinforced gender binary. People who are gender non-conforming or agender or non-binary in their gender identity um, or in their gender expression may have been assigned male at birth, may have been assigned female at birth, in some rare cases might have been assigned intersex. They may or may not take steps to socially, legally, or medically transition, just like those who are transfeminine or transmasculine. So I just use the phrase, may or may not take steps to socially, legally, or medically transition, keeping in mind that transition is not a goal for a substantial percentage of transgender people. Trans people may take action in these three areas. For many people, aligning their gender identity and expression is very important. Some people help create a more unified self by making changes in either social, medical, or legal areas. Each person obviously makes a unique set of choices. Some people's goal is to transition from one gender to another, while other people may take action to reach some different point of emotional or physical wholeness, which may include some actions in one of these three areas. So quickly, just to kind of define what these areas are. So social choices or transition could be things like coming out or creating a personal environment in which a person's gender identity is known and ideally respected by others, such as friends, family, and coworkers. Medical choices or transition might be using hormone, hormones or surgical interventions to more closely align someone's body with their gender identity or to feel more comfortable in their skin. Legal choices or transition would involve changing identity documents. It may be some identity documents or a lot of identity documents that might shift their name and or their gender marker that reflects their more current and authentic gender identity. So understanding that there are different choices and steps that people make when they um, change their gender will help service providers know that um, what are the right questions to ask people? For example, a service provider may need to know somebody's legal name, like what name is on their identification for court papers. But that's not necessarily the name that a person uses during one-on-one -on -one interactions with that client. So we might need to, to know about somebody's gender-related surgery, um, potentially if they're having a forensic exam, so that it would help with that process. So I use the word several times, the phrases gender identity and expression. Um, 
it can be, um, I'm sorry, it can be a, a lot of things, gender identity or expression. Um, it can be how, gender identity can be um, how we express um, our identity, and it can be a social construct or many other things. Often when we talk about gender identity and expression, people tend to think that these concepts only apply to transgender people. So let me share a little bit with you about how these phrases apply to all of us. So gender identity and expression are a bit different from each other. So first let's talk about gender identity, which is an individual's internal sense of being male, female, or something in between, or something outside of, or any other gender not necessarily visible to other people. We all have a gender identity. For most of us, it's male or female. But there are literally hundreds of gender identities and ways that people classify or think about their gender. Gender identity is what's in somebody's head. It's how they view themselves and their gender. In contrast to gender identity, gender expression is how people express their gender through clothing or grooming or speech, hairstyle, body language, social interactions, or other types of behaviors. This is what other people see. Of course, it's totally possible that other people are not seeing what we might hope that they see about us. They may be misreading our expression or our gendered cues, but gender expression is our outward, experience, outward appearance and mannerisms. We all make choices about how much effort we put forth um, to follow societal norms around gender expectations and how much time and effort we spend on looking in a particular way. All of us, too, don't have a 100% consistent gender expression. For example, when we go to the gym, we tend to dress very differently than when we go to a formal dinner. Our gender identity may, be, uh, may not be changing when we change our clothes, but what we put on and what messages we send about our gender may change based on situation or mood or requirement. So like if we need to go to our job, we may dress very differently and express our gender very differently than when we're with our friends. So there are hundreds of choices related to gender expression and other gender-related options. And just a few more slides before um, Larie's going to take over. Um, one of the things that we hear a lot is, um, you know, I just don't get get it. Just tell me what language to use, and you know, let me use it, and and then I, I just don't want to get it right, or I don't want to get it wrong. I want to want to use the right language. And what we tend to tell people is that the only right language is the the language that your client uses. So how does your client refer to themselves? What language does your client use, and has asked you to use, and prefer you to use? So those are the right language. That's the right set of language. And then conversely, with that client, the only wrong language is intentionally using words or phrases that are in contradiction to what your client has indicated is comfortable for them and aligns with their gender identity. So if there aren't right and wrong lists of, of terms and definitions to study and learn, you might be wondering, well, how do I, how do I get it right? And the answer is, really simple and it's kind of complex at the same time and that answer is to listen and to listen really carefully sometimes it's it's a lot easier said than done to, to listen but when we listen carefully and then we ask relevant questions sensitively and we listen some more and we ask maybe clarifying questions if we need to and then we listen some more we are almost assuredly going to be treating people with an incredible amount of respect and dignity so the really good news for advocates is that almost all advocates have really good listening skills and have already mastered this. So working with trans clients is, is really simple um, for folks who have really good listening skills. So that was a really short 25 minutes or so of Trans 101. And I, I wanted to share with you where you can get more information because we've just touched the, the tip of the iceberg. So I want to share with you um, four different areas, uh, webinars, some fact sheets, some publications, and a toolkit about where you can learn more Trans 101 information. So I'm going to highlight work that, that Forge has contributed to. Obviously, there are, are lots of places online that you can access other resources. Um, but we're one of the few agencies that actually does that intersection between trans and uh, victimization, sexual assault, domestic violence, stalking. So if you go to our webinar, our, our website, you'll find that we have over 50 hours of recorded trainings 
So you can see on the screen, you can access training and events and then go down to recorded webinars. Some of the ones that I just wanted to point out that might be of interest to the folks on this call, we have a webinar on forensic exams with sexual assault survivors um, who are trans. We have a webinar on rural or non-urban trans survivors. We have a really interesting webinar on the VAWA non-discrimination conditions that might be um, very interesting to the people that are not really sure what that means and, and what needs to happen. We have webinars on stalking, on power and control, on lots of different subjects. So I encourage you to, to look at the list and, and maybe find some time to listen to one of those webinars. We also have many fact sheets, and those fact sheets are generally one or two pages. And they really um, summarize some of the concepts that we just talked about in the last half hour. So again, I encourage you to look at those, and they're, they're really easy to read and very short. We also have some longer publications, uh, again, if you want to have some more in-depth experience with transgender issues and specifically victimization. So like there's a slide on the screen that shows sheltering transgender women. We'll also be having um, two other publications that are going to be coming out fairly soon, one on sheltering transgender men and one on sheltering gender non-binary individuals. Um, there's other things like about tips for coalitions to talk about bathroom access and the fears around people having uh, sexual assault fears. Lots of other publications that we encourage you to look at. And the fourth thing that I wanted to share with you is an online toolkit that we created with the Office for Victims of Crime. And this is really, um, it's a very uh, complete toolkit. It's about two years old right now, year and a half old, but it, it has a lot of information that goes from Trans 101, so lots of detailed information on Trans 101, and then it breaks down um, sexual assault within the transgender community and talks about different types of providers, um, people like law enforcement and therapists and support group leaders, and then it talks about tips for those people who serve uh, trans survivors. So you'll see in that toolkit, some of the images that you've seen in this webinar that kind of highlight those different areas. So we encourage you to look at that, and it's um, it's very long and, and in depth, but will give you a, a better sense of of trans issues and how to work with with trans clients. And this is another one of the Espavo photos, and I'm going to turn things over to Laurie, who's going to guide us through the next two sections. Yes, this is um, this is Laurie Cook Daniels. I am also still looking at the questions um, that are coming in, so I'm a little I'm catching up with us all. Um, most of where I'm doing the data and implications section. Um, so if Michael will move us along. Many of you know who Brene Brown is. For those who don't, she is a researcher mostly focused on shame and vulnerability. If you haven't read her books or watched one of her TED Talks, we encourage you to check her out. She has some powerful quotes. On the screen is one that is so relevant to the information we'll be sharing next. She writes, stories are just data with a soul. As we go through the next slides, we'd like you to keep in mind that every single number we talk about today has a story behind it. These numbers represent real people's lives. It is sometimes easy to forget that when we are looking at bar charts and percentages. The rates of sexual violence for transgender people are between 50 and 66 percent. That is compared to the general population in which the figures are generally accepted to be about 33 percent for women and girls, one in six one in three, and 18 percent or one in six for boys and men. Fifty percent of trans people experience sexual violence at some point. If one percent of Americans are trans, that would be three million people. And if half of them are sexual violence survivors, that means we're talking about 1.5 million transgender sexual violence survivors. Rates of intimate partner violence are roughly the same for people of all gender identities and sexual orientations, although there is some newer research that is suggesting that rates might be higher for transgender and lesbian, gay, bisexual people, 
but that data is not inclusive yet. In terms of the number of trans intimate partner violence survivors, um, about 25 to 33 percent um, are survivors, so if 1 percent of, of Americans are trans, that means 3 million people, so that would be 750,000 um, to 1 million trans survivors of ITV. The rates of stalking for trans people are also higher than those of the national average. While we don't have great statistics on stalking in trans populations, some surveys have indicated that between 15 and 20 percent of trans people experience stalking compared to 5 to 17 percent of non-trans people. So again, the number of trans stalking survivors, 1 percent of Americans, 15 to 20 percent are stalking survivors. We're talking between 450,000 and 600,000 trans survivors. We could look at a lot of other data that shows increased rates of health disparities, but we felt it was important to include this particular slide on suicide attempts. This, um, this data from uh, this slide is from the National Transgender Discrimination Study that was released in 2011. Many people who experience sexual violence feel hopeless and suicidal. Many trans people with or without sexual assault experiences also feel suicidal. As you can see, the disparity between how many non-trans people attempt suicide and those who are trans and attempt suicide is profoundly different. With only 1.6% of the general U.S. population attempting suicide and 41% or more of trans people attempting, we can imagine some of the reasons why trans people may be more likely to take action to end their lives. We know that due to the high rates of violence, discrimination, and other forms of abuse, trans people may be more vulnerable and may feel more helpless and hopeless. This is especially true if trans people are un- or underemployed or are living without insurance that would allow them to access competent mental health care services. Rates of suicide attempts rise even higher than 41% for those trans people who have been sexually assaulted, then it goes to 64%. Those sexually assaulted by a teacher, for instance, in grades K through 12, that goes to 69%. And those who are physically assaulted by a teacher, 76%. This chart on polyvictimization is from a study that Forge conducted in 2011. We had 1,005 valid transgender respondents. This particular question was a simple demographic question and one we didn't anticipate having substantially meaningful information, but it turned out to be quite informative. What this chart means is that 84% of people who check the box for having experienced stalking, for example, also experienced at least one other form of the violence listed, which is hate-motivated violence, stalking, intimate partner violence, dating violence, adult sexual assault, or child sexual assault. This chart indicates that trans people are experiencing multiple forms of violence and multiple types of violence at very high rates. This slide may be slightly surprising to some who have a bit of trans anti-violence knowledge. In our 2011 findings, and again, those respondents were national and represented a broad spectrum of people in the trans community. We saw that transmasculine individuals experienced higher rates of violence than trans feminine people in childhood sexual abuse, adult sexual assault, dating violence, domestic violence, and stalking. We do recognize that trans women in our survey and in many other sources of data collection do experience higher rates of hate-motivated violence. This is especially true when we look at street-based or public setting-based hate violence. There are also substantially higher rates of hate-motivated violence against Black and Latina trans women. Those were some heavy numbers to take in. Let us just pause for a moment here with this great photo of a young gender non-binary person 
who reminds us of hope for the future. Now let's move on to talk about barriers and why trans people may not be accessing services. These barriers are from research FORGE conducted in 2011 and derived from qualitative answers trans respondents gave to questions about why they wouldn't or might not access specific types of sexual and domestic violence services. The ranking of barriers is roughly in the order of most reported to least. However, please note that when we examine data sets by geography and other variables, the order of why people were not accessing services changed from area to area. Our 2011 survey respondents identified 10 top barriers as to why they would not or might not access sexual assault related services. In the next slides, I'll go into a bit more depth on the five of these that are in bold. For some of these five, I'll also add a bit about the barrier impact, how the barriers impact trans survivors in rural communities in particular. The top 10 bar barriers include fear, not trans welcoming or trans friendly, not culturally competent, didn't know what the service was, reputation, woman focused, shame, embarrassment, and stigma, concern it would make things worse, systemic problems, and costs. Sadly, trans people said that if they experienced sexual assault or domestic violence, the number one reason they would be hesitant to seek care or did not seek care was due to fear. When we looked at responses, people were afraid of abuse, hostility, rejection, derision, judgment, discrimination. They were afraid of being outed. They were afraid of the other clients. They were afraid of denial of services. And they were afraid of being the only trans person in the group. One of the tangible things that many trans people are fearful about is incongruent or mismatching documentation. 41% of trans people do not have identification that aligns with their gender. That means that 41% of trans people may feel uncomfortable showing their ID. It, the problem may be because it doesn't look like their current self, or it may have a name that is not congruent with the name they use every day, or the gender designation is not correct. They may also avoid seeking services because they don't want to be outed by their identification, or because they fear service providers may act in discriminatory ways because of the incongruent documentation. Some providers have asked us in the past why people don't just change their documentation. It's important to note that not everyone wants to change their name or gender, legally or socially. A major barrier for many people who do want to change their documentation is cost. Legal name changes can be well over $300 plus other fees to change additional forms of identity documents. Many trans people need that money to pay rent or to eat. This uh, shows what I mean, what we mean when we say the documentation uh, may not line up. This is a transgender man showing his um, California driver's license. In rural communities, there may be additional fears around being outed as trans. Trans people may be living in rural areas without anyone knowing of their trans history. Many people in rural communities may have dual relationships and may know each other in multiple areas of their lives. If there is one church in town, it's likely that the trans person, law enforcement, and the advocate, as well as the offender, may all attend that same church, for example. In smaller communities, there can be fears of dividing the community people not wanting people to take sides, since people often rely on each other and need to get along. The second highest reason why people might not or would not access sexual assault services is concern if an agency is trans welcoming or trans friendly. By trans welcoming we mean, does a trans person sense that the environment and attitude are friendly and respectful? This tends to be more about an about individual providers' attitudes or the attitude of an agency. 
It can also be about the little signs and signals that send the message of being welcoming. One of the things we like to equate this to is about inviting someone over to your house for dinner. That in itself is a welcoming and friendly attitude and gesture. Trans people reported comments like, will people be comfortable with me? Will I be accepted? Will people be hostile? In rural communities, an additional challenge might be that the area is more conservative or holds more traditional values, which can translate to more homophobia or transphobia. On the plus side, rural communities tend to do a great job at looking after their own. So people may put aside political or personal differences and show great care and compassion for their neighbors and community members. The third reason uh, people were afraid was the issue of cultural competency, by which we mean is an agency informed on how to respectfully treat trans people when they walk in the door. This is really all about skills. So if we look at trans welcoming as an invitation over to my house for dinner, cultural competency is about my cooking skills. And if I'm actually going to prepare a meal that is safe to eat, no food poisoning. It goes a step further, too, to being aware of dietary needs. In other words, no gluten or no pork if you are Jewish, or no alcohol if you might be pregnant, etc. Which means I have to ask the right questions of you, my guest, as well as knowing enough about your culture or needs to actually serve you in a sensitive and safe way. When we step back into a domestic violence sexual assault context, Trans people may be wondering, will I be asked invasive questions? Trans people can usually tell many stories about how many times people have asked about their genitals or surgical status, which is almost never appropriate. appropriate. Trans people may be wondering, will they use my name and pronouns correctly? They may wonder, will I have to educate my provider? This is a major concern of trans people who are generally paying for services but end up needing to educate their provider. When a client is in crisis, this is not the best time for them to act as teacher. They may be wondering, can the provider deal with my body? Many trans people are not comfortable with their bodies or have bodies that others are often uncomfortable with because they do not align with what people expect their body to be. Trans people frequently deal with providers who stare ask inappropriate questions, or refuse to serve them because of their body. Let me go offline for just a moment. I needed some water, thank you. As we mentioned before, some smaller or rural communities might be more conservative or have staff or volunteers who have received less training on cultural diversity. Staff may have multiple roles and may not be as up to speed on every issue as staff in larger cities with agencies who may, have, who may have more staff who can specialize and have specific diversity knowledge. Reputation was probably the most potent reason why people are hesitant or do not ex access services. It didn't score number one but it probably was the most emotionally loaded in terms of how people talked about reputation. The trans community tends to be very interconnected and tightly knit. When one person has a negative experience at an agency or with a particular provider, the word spreads very quickly. One person's negative experience shared with someone else can dramatically influence the entire community and paint the service agency as unwelcoming or culturally incompetent, or any number of negative things. The end result, though, is that the agency's reputation is severely damaged and, more importantly, survivors who need services are not getting them. They aren't going to be willing to walk through the doors because they believe, whether it's true or not, that the agency is not going to treat them well. In one of the communities Forge has worked with, a very large metropolitan area, there was a very vocal transgender leader who had had a negative experience with one of the rape crisis centers in his city. Because people looked up to him as a leader, 
They valued his opinion. In this case, he didn't just share his opinion about this particular rape crisis center with people who asked. He was proactive about telling people how horrible this agency was. People believed him. They looked up to him. As a result, the agency has tried to repair their reputation over the past six to seven years, and they have had a continued uphill battle. He had so much influence in the community that they have not been able to recruit many trans volunteers, be part of trans community events, etc. The power of community is extremely strong. We can't stress how significant this point is or how difficult it is to address once a bad reputation has been um, placed on an agency. In the case of smaller or rural communities, they may have a, one agency that serves a 50-mile radius. That one agency may provide all types of services. It may be difficult for that agency to maintain a positive reputation in all of the areas of services they provide. There can also be substantial safety concerns for trans people who have limited options of where to seek services. Because communities are small, there may be concerns that the intake person at that one agency is a parent of the offender, for example. Sexual assault and domestic violence movements emerged out of the women's and feminist movements. Violence against women has been the focus of most anti-violence agencies. Times are changing a bit, in part due to non-female survivors stepping forward. Think Penn State, the priest abuse controversy, public figures in the news, etc. However, many agencies still have female names, such as the Women's Center. Think about how difficult that might be for a transgender person to walk through those doors. This may be hard for someone who identifies as female now, but has not always lived as female. It certainly is difficult for those who are living as male now as well as for people who don't identify with either male or female. It is often unclear what an agency's policies are around gender or gender services. Who can access services in an agency? What kinds of proof must be offered if the agency does segregate people by gender? It is not just the agency's name that might be woman-focused. Newsletters that highlight survivors' stories, descriptions of events, and website language may all include only references to female sexual assault survivors. Pronouns and names may align with the male perpetrator female victim model, and survivors that don't fit neatly in that paradigm may feel erased and unsure that they can access services there. When people feel like there is nowhere for them to go for services or for help, it can stimulate a feeling of hopelessness. Rural communities may adhere more to older school models of service and more traditional belief systems. Smaller communities may maintain attitudes about rigid gender roles, as well as may continue to believe that non-transgender women are the only victims of sexual assault and domestic violence. These beliefs may impinge on serving transgender survivors. In the interest of time, we're not going to share more about the other barriers now. The bottom line, though, is that everyone deserves to have access to healing services and a life not ruled by trauma. And now we're going to switch back to Michael. Thanks, Lori. So in this kind of take-home section, the what you can do section, there are going to be some reminders of what we've already covered, as well as some ways that you can make make sure that your trans survivors are receiving the support and respect that they deserve. We're going to pair kind of a concept with some specifics for advocates. And again, for those of you who are not working in an advocate role, um, I think you can probably modify what we're talking about to fit the role that you do serve. So the first thing is the terms paradox. So we kind of started out with this at the beginning as kind of a foundational principle. So we want to remember that terms are critical and we want to crucial and critical and we want to find out what terms the person uses and then use those, those words, their language as a primary way of conveying respect and openness towards them. 
and we also need to know that some of those those terms may not tell us what we need to know in order to provide appropriate services. So as an advocate, the survivor may want you to help them make sure that other providers or systems respect the language that they use for them. So of course we want to make sure that we ask the survivor if they want that level of help or that that kind of involvement from you, but that's one of the things that advocates can do is, is to try to help with other service providers or other people to make sure that others are using language that's respectful. So the other thing that we talked about early on was master status. So we want to keep in mind that um, we don't want to be trapped by the label of primary potency or the master status label, but we want to have more of a both and and way of looking at issues and people. So for advocates, you may need to remind other victim service providers to not make assumptions or decisions based on the fact that a survivor is transgender. Again, you know, find out what the survivor wants in terms of your advocacy, but this is another area where you can possibly step in and help other professionals not get distracted from providing the best services possible to the trans survivor that you're both working with. One of the, the first interactions that a survivor may have with your organization is the information gathered by phone or on an intake form. So making sure that your paperwork and your computer systems allow for options that may better fit trans survivors and possibly many other survivors. Um, for example, when asking about sex or gender, make sure that there's more than just male or female as options. You know, have a write-in field, have some other choices for people. And similarly, make sure that there are places where clients can share the name that they regularly use, which might be different than their legal name. So for advocates, you know, we know that you may not have direct control over your agency's forms or systems or the systems of other agencies that you're working with, but you can help survivors by reminding them that they don't need to answer those male or female checkbox questions and that you respect them and acknowledge who they are even if the forms or the systems fail to do so. So when interacting with clients verbally or face-to-face -face or in, in any way, it's really important to find out and, and use what name and pronouns they, they use for themselves. So we recommend um, kind of starting the ball rolling by introducing yourself in a way that kind of sets the example and lets them know that you understand that uh, people may have names and pronouns that might not be obvious or might not be um, apparent to everybody. So you could introduce yourself to a client by saying, you know, hi, my name is Michael and I use he, him, and his pronouns. What name would and pronouns would you like me to use for you? So kind of opening up that question and allowing them to, to answer in one of the first interactions that you have with them. So the key points here are to ask the person what name and pronouns they use, and then to listen to their responses, and so listening and remembering what their responses are, and then consistently using that name and pronoun that they shared with you. So for advocates, after you know the, the person's name and pronouns that they, they use regularly, ask them about if they would like you to help smooth the way by stepping in if or when another provider misspeaks or may not know what their correct pronoun and names are. So transgender people have often faced harassment and discrimination or violence in restrooms. Having a safe bathroom environment for trans clients is an important part of helping trans clients feel welcome and comfortable. Many agencies we know rent buildings and, and may not be able to do things like remodel their building to make bathrooms unisex or single stall. But when it's possible, have at least one bathroom that is a single stall or is open to people of any gender. If binary bathrooms, male-female bathrooms, are the only options, one of the things that agencies can do is to add signage in the bathroom that helps remind all users of that bathroom that the bathroom is for anybody who identifies with the gender of the bathroom and that policing a person's gender is not acceptable. So as advocates, one of the thing, um, things that you can do, since you don't necessarily have control over the bathrooms in your agency or in the buildings that you might be um, helping your clients with, you can offer to 
basically act as a buddy or a buddy system and accompany that survivor to a bathroom if the bathroom is gendered. You might end up waiting outside the door or going in with them, or you might be able to scope out where the nearest gender neutral bathroom is for them. So those are just some of the things that you can do to help make clients feel that their basic needs can be taken care of in a safe and comfortable and non-harassing way. Another one of the take-homes is around having trans or LGBT materials. Um, having these kind of materials in your waiting areas or literature racks or wherever you have some public spaces is really important in helping clients feel welcome and, inclu and included. Most offices don't have a lot of space, so trans-specific materials might be too difficult to actually put out. But when it's possible, it's important to have things like subscriptions to national LGBT magazines or have copies of your state's or, or community's LGBT newspaper available in those public areas. Sometimes having posters or other materials are effective too in helping clients feel like um, you know that you know that they exist and um, that they're welcome in your space. So for advocates, um, I want to let you know that we have non-geographically specific brochures that are for transgender survivors, and we would be more than happy to send you as many brochures as you'd like. So just let us know um, how many you'd like, and we'll we'll send them to you. So those can either be put out for display or you can have them in your office and, and directly hand them to a trans client that you're working with. So this next slide is on violent non-discrimination and this might be more of a, a, an extended homework than a reminder tip. Many of you know that there were substantial changes in the Violence Against Women Act when it was reauthorized two years ago. And if you don't know about those changes already, um, you may want to investigate it more um, because some of the changes directly affect transgender clients as well as people who are gay or lesbian and some tribal folks. There's a lot of things that were changed in the Violence Against Women reauthorization. One of the things that you can do that's fairly simple is download and read the Department of Justice's Office for Civil Rights Frequently Asked Questions. Um, it's a very short document, I believe it's 11 pages, and it's in a Q&A format. And it really helps share some of the critical pieces in the reauthorization around things like sex-specific or sex-segregated spaces. So as advocates, um, since you now know more about um, trans rights and sur trans survivors. If you read this very brief document, you'll have an even better sense of how to advocate for them through systems um, that's under the federal law. So it's really important to know what resources are available. We've talked about a lot of resources today, and most of you are already connected with other agencies and resources in your area and across the state. And if not, we want to make sure that you um, can get connected with those transgender-specific um, agencies and um, LGBT agencies, as well as publications or information that is transgender-specific. So we wanted to make sure that you know that there are plenty of resources on our website, for example, that are transgender-specific and for survivors. So you can help direct your survivors that you're working with who are trans to publications, like the two that are on the screen right now are a self-help guide to heal and understand from sexual um, assault, and a guide that's about how to think about accessing therapy if you're trans and a survivor. So as advocates, know about what these resources are and, and help share them with the clients that you work with. It's really easy sometimes to get distracted by pieces of information that might not be um, as common or familiar to you. So one of the things that we really encourage you to do is to keep in mind that trans clients may have needs that are totally unrelated to their trans identity or their history. So as advocates, this is probably really obvious and really you know what you do already. But to stay focused on what your client needs and then connect them with the resources that are appropriate for their needs. So that's the job that you do all the time, and that's the job that you can easily do with the trans survivors that you're serving. And keeping learning is, is another one of these take-home things. And I think no matter how much we know about anything, it's always important to keep learning. And we welcome you to learn more about transgender survivors. You know, Again, we've got 
over 50 hours of free archived webinar trainings in addition to, to the hundreds of pages of printable materials. But of course, there are other places to keep on learning and other issues that may be important to keep up with, um, like trauma theory or new laws or policies or new ways to start difficult conversations or just about anything else. So we encourage you to keep learning about whatever it is that you feel you need to know more about. And client-centered care is the second to last take home. And it's, it's really important to have strong client-centered skills. And sometimes those client-centered skills are more important or just as important as specific cultural competency or knowledge or training. So for advocates, you know, I doubt that any of you need to hear this, but it's so vital to all survivors to be heard and believed. And with trans survivors, you may need to be a little bit more patient, allowing a little bit more time for trust to be built, since sometimes trans survivors have had really negative experiences with, with providers. You might need to be a little bit more persistent, and I don't mean that in a harassing sort of way, but persistent in terms of making sure that the trans client knows that your door is always open to them, that they can come back for more support, that they can test the waters, um, that you're going to be there for them. And trans survivors, like all survivors, need compassion. Many times, trans people walk through the world constantly being surrounded by discrimination and microaggressions and violence. And for some, it's a rare thing when someone shows them kindness and compassion. You can be that someone who makes a profound difference by simply being compassionate. So that's a really simple thing um, to keep in mind. And I wanted to end this section and move into Q&A with this quote. Um, this is from a colleague of ours, Helen Boyd, who's an amazing writer. And, and she, uh, let me just read this quote for you because it's, it's just really right on the mark. She says, maybe I've been doing this too long. But in preparing to do a presentation for a local organization this week, all I keep thinking is that I want to walk in and say, trans women are women, trans men are men, and some people are neither or both. Don't worry about their genitals, their socialization, or anything except whatever services you're providing for them. Ask everyone what name and pronouns they prefer for themselves, and then use them. And she says, end of Trans 101. And obviously, I know it's not that simple, but Really, it really kind of is, isn't it? And I think that's really a good summary of, of what we've been talking about today. So there's one more Espavo picture. And then I want to just remind folks of, of how to stay connected with us. And we'll move into some question and answers. So on all of the slides that you'll be receiving um, by mail tomorrow, you'll have our web address. So we encourage you to, to check out what's there if you'd like. Um, and in another effort not to be self-promoting, but where you'll find information about upcoming trainings and about new articles and new resources is through our social media. So we encourage you to follow us and, and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And I know some of you are live tweeting today, which is really great. Thank you very much. Um, and we, we look forward to connecting with you as well as sharing information with you in those platforms. So we have around 15 minutes left for um, some questions. And I know Larry's been sorting through them as we've been going and answering a bunch of them as we've, we've moved through today. So Larry, can you set up some questions for us? Yes. The first one I'd like you to do is someone suggested that you role play for the webinar participants how you would find out what language a trans person uses so that you could reflect it back to them. OK. Um, we could do this in a lot of ways. Um, so Larry, are you going to role play with me? Yes. OK. Um, so let's set up the situation um, where somebody is wants to go receive um, a forensic exam and have evidence collected. And the trans person may want to want to disclose to the advocate um, a piece of information about their body so that the advocate can share it with the forensic nurse. OK. On like a, a decent thing? OK. Would, which role would you like to play? I will be the, the survivor. OK. Um, 
Solari, thanks for, for being here. And I know that you want to move forward with a forensic exam. Um, I'm really glad that you're here. Um, before we, we step in, I want to know like how I can best support you in the exam, either in the exam room or any information that you'd like me to share with the forensic nurse before we get in the room. Do you want to share with me anything that you're concerned about or anything that you'd like me to do in particular? Well, I, I really, really hate the word trans woman. I just, I am a woman. I'm not trans. Um, I've always been a woman. So, you know, I don't, I don't want to hear trans woman. Um, and, you know, if I hear, if the person calls me he, I'm going to get up and leave. Okay, yeah, I can understand that that would be really upsetting. So would you like me to to talk to the forensic nurse before you go in and, and have that discussion with her? Yes, I would like you to say that, tell her that I am a woman and I don't want her to call me anything other than that. Okay, yeah, that's really important. I, I understand that. So just to be clear, you, you don't want to hear the word trans woman. You identify as a woman, you are a woman and you only want to hear the, the pronouns she. Is that correct? That's correct. Great. Let me, let me find somebody else to sit with you right now, and let me go chat with uh, the forensic nurse, and I'll be right back, OK? OK, okay and let's break there. Yep. And Michael, what I'd like, um, I would like to introduce myself to you. Um, my name is Laurie Cook Daniels, and I go by the pronoun she. And what is your name? Um, I'm Michael, and I use they, them, and theirs. Excellent. Thank you very much. So that was an on-the-spot role play, and, and I hate role plays, so hopefully that was a decent role play for, for, for the question that was asked. OK. Um, we also um, we had a couple of questions about how the barriers differ for trans people of color. OK. Were there more specific questions around those? Not really. OK. Um, well, I don't know that we have. I, I, I think that those are really, that's a really good thing to think about. Um, I know that we shared today about fear as being the primary um, barrier, the, like the biggest barrier. And I think that if we can, we can look at things and kind of project out that um, fear for people of color may be um, slightly different than for, for non-people of color, um, particularly around potential police involvement. Um, I think that, that that's going to be a really big issue for a lot of folks. I think it's an issue for, for all trans folks, but especially for people of color. Um, Lori, do you have, I know you did that section on what some of those barriers are. Do you have some comments on that? Um, I think, um, I think if you're in an area where there is a lot of tension between um, communities of color and non-communities of color, um, that, that you're going to be aware of what those tensions are, and they'll probably go over into the trans community. But in general, um, you know, we, we did focus on the trans part of it. And let me, oh. I, I, what, I, what I just heard you say, Lorraine, I, I think that, I'm, I just would like to restate it, because I think that what you were saying is that um, in communities, what people of color are facing and challenged with is going to be, uh, what non-trans people of color are challenged with is going to be similar to what trans people of color are going to be challenged with. So some of those barriers are going to be just parallel moving across from trans and non-trans people. Is that what you were saying? Um, yes, and not, the person is is at saying in what ways is the fear higher for people of color, and I'm I'm not sure that it it automatically is higher for people of color. I'm not sure that it is either. Um, you know, just to give you a couple of examples of where it might be higher, um, we do know that some of the street based violence tends to be higher for African American and Latina trans women. So there may be um, fears around street-based violence in addition to sexual assault or domestic violence. 
there might be concerns around um, what some people call um, walking while trans, so concerns about being arrested just for walking down the street, which seems to happen a lot for people of color, trans women of color in particular, where police think that um, trans women of color are sex workers when they are not necessarily. So there may be some fears around those issues in particular. Okay, uh, another question. If the insurance is under one gender and that is placed on the paperwork, I would, uh, I would, oops, I just lost it here. Um, I assume we should still ask the survivor what they want to be called and continue to use the correct pronouns. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Okay. And um, how many, add, go, go ahead. ahead. I was going to say, just to add to that, I think one of the things um, that we didn't talk about today was kind of the know and tell why, which is if if you need to bill paper, you know, bill the insurance under one name, it may, may be useful to have that discussion with the client of like, we want to make sure that your bill gets paid and we really respect your gender and your gender identity and I will always call you whatever the name is that they, they have said they identify as um, and just to spell that out clear for them. Okay, um, we've been asked if we have any uh, resources specific for military trans survivors. And no, I we don't at this point, um, but I do know that um, we have a couple of TA requests that are outstanding, and I think we're going to end up with some, some information about military trans survivors in the next year. Okay, and we were asked how many SANE nurses have transgender experience? I assume that means not that they are trans themselves, but that they've worked with trans people. Um, and I'm assuming we don't have any idea how many have trans experience. Um, yeah, we do, I don't think we know how many have trans experience. I know that um, I have done a lot of training across the country in the last two years and have done a lot of work with forensic nurses and on forensic nurse topics um, around forensic exams. So I do know that a fair number of forensic nurses have received training. And I also know that we, we were part of um, some of the revisions in the protocols. And so I, I think that people have exposure to knowledge. So forensic nurses have exposure to the knowledge. But whether they have direct experience or not is unknown. OK. I did have someone ask about the, the term queer and uh, said they had trouble defining that and understanding how it fit within the LGBT um, category. Do you want to address that? I, that's a really big question and it's a controversial question. Um, it's also a generational question. A lot of times um, younger folks are using queer to be an all-encompassing term. So it can relate to gender identity or sexual orientation, either one or both. And for some people, it's very, very uncomfortable. And it's it's one of those terms that it's often better when a person refers to themselves that way versus when someone else um, uses that language when they don't identify as queer. Okay. We did have, have a question about whether we had any um, data on trafficking. Uh, among trans people, either adults or youth? And I think the answer is we don't have that data. I don't think we do. Um, I just saw an article the other day, and it was about LGBT youth, and I don't know if it, if it broke out trans youth specifically on trafficking. If um, I'm going to advance the slide to our, our contact information. If the person that asked that wants to email either one of us, I will follow and find that article. Okay. Um, we have someone that's written in as a white trans man and an LGBTQ victim advocate who works with a lot of trans women of color. Is it useful to disclose my status as a trans man to help them open up in order to get their case moving forward in a more positive way? That's a really good question. I think it's really personal. Lori, do you, do you want to answer that? Um, what I have heard in the... Um, when it comes to aging LGBT people, is that it can actually put more pressure on someone who's trying to be closeted um, to have the worker come out to them. So I don't think that there's um, a universal do this, don't do that uh, piece of advice that we, we could give you. Um, 
you know we're all different and some some people will think that you coming out to them is a is a bid to take the attention away from them um, so I, I'm not sure that there's a I'm not sure what answer to give you on that one I think Larry you just mentioned the the really critical point which which is is something that I think we all know which is we don't want to take away um, the time and the care and the attention towards the survivor. So if disclosing in a quick and easy way helps that survivor feel more connected or more easily willing or wanting to talk or share or trust, that's great. But make it short and then refocus on their needs. Okay. Another question, should all trans survivors be informed about emergency contraception in the ER? rather than trying to identify if they might be at risk of pregnancy? Um, so that would apply um, only to folks that have uterus and ovaries. And my answer would be yes. I think it would be good standard practice to talk to everybody about that, um, especially if they've disclosed that they had vaginal penetration. Um, I think it's a good thing to talk about, because I think a lot of times trans guys don't think that they can get pregnant. And they may not even think to ask about that. And so, yeah, I think as an advocate or as a medical provider, it should be brought up. Okay. Um, I've got someone that said, I think this is a follow-up to something we just said. So if we have known many transgendered people, we should not mention this to the survivor. Do you Say it again. have a comment? Yeah, I'm not sure that I heard the question. Can you say it again? So there's no question. Well, so if we have known many transgender people, we should not mention this to a transgender survivor. Mm. I think that's really like a case by case thing. I think sometimes trans people feel feel really comforted to know that that you know something about trans people, and so that sometimes can feel really affirming, and sometimes it can be really feeling like objectifying, like, oh, I know trans people. So I think it's really going to depend on on what you're sharing and how you're sharing it and, and why you're sharing it. And that's a slippery answer, but I think it's case dependent. Okay. Um, going back, we had a couple of people that made comments that when you're both trans and a person of color, you're facing twice the barriers of white trans people because you're fearing both transphobia and racism. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to add that that was the, the approach of some of the people, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, that are, that are, we're asking more about trans people of color. I think that's really, I'd like to make a comment, a, a couple comments on that. One is that I think that, you know, that's an excellent thing to, when, when there's intersections of both being trans and people of color, we also hear that around if you're a person of color and disabled or a trans person and disabled, you know, some of those those multiple intersections. Um, sometimes I think the more intersections folks have, the more fear that they may have or the more challenges with accessing appropriate services. And potentially the more resilience and tools they may have. Yes, potentially, yes. Yeah. Okay, let me do this as the last one, because um, it, it's one of the harder ones we've gotten. Is there advice you can give in regard to advocacy units that have a history of being associated with heteronormative client care systems? Is there advice you can give in regard to advocacy units? Oh, that, that was a re repeat. Um. Advocacy systems in terms of just in general or a specific. Um, well, they didn't. They didn't tell me that. Um, but I think they're they're saying moving from a system that assumes um, the violence against women um, mindset into one that is more trans inclusive would be sure. my guess. Would you like to answer? Um, I, uh, that is a big, um, I, I think that's, that's a big challenge. It's one that the whole system is looking at, is trying to move the system from thinking that uh, violence against women is um, a, a political um, 
issue versus are we doing victim services. And um, if we switch to looking at what we're doing as victim services, it becomes easier to do it in a more gender inclusive way. So um, they have added, I guess just mainly in regard to advocacy skills that could be adapted to better adhere to this issue. Um, yeah, and I think to add to what you said, Lurie, I think when we look at like how do we adapt skills, um, if we're doing really good advocacy, I think that the heteronormative part um, could or should go away if we're really client-centered, if we're really focused on on serving that one survivor. And I know that doesn't change the system, but I think it's it's all of our responsibility when we're able to to step in and and challenge some of those heteronormative and um, other types of, of kind of old school thinking. So I think we all need to step in when we can, and if we stay survivor centered, we're gonna we're gonna end up with a good result for that particular client, and hopefully we can nudge the system forward so that it's better and easier for future clients that come through that system. And that's a really big question. It's a very it's a very difficult question, and I'm not sure. I think we could probably have a really good dialogue about that um, in ways that that this format doesn't necessarily lend itself to. Okay, I think that that's it for our time. Great. Well, thank you everybody for being here and for sticking with us for, for 90 minutes. Um, just a reminder again, uh, we've mentioned a couple times, we will send out the link to the recording tomorrow as well as a link to the PowerPoints. And we really value your feedback, so as soon as this webinar closes, you'll get an evaluation form and we'd really like to hear your thoughts. And please look forward to other webinars that we're going to be doing in 2016, which are not scheduled yet, but will be very soon. So thank you again for everybody for being here, and I hope that we see you again soon.